Peace, family. It's your brother, Mark Lamont Hill. You're joining me on the Mark Lamont Hill official YouTube channel. We like to have updates every day. We like to have conversations every day. But of course, we also like to, every once in a while, bring in a good debate. And today is one of those days where we're going to have a good, spirited, civil debate for the next hour. And I'll tell you how it started. I posted about a month ago, Five Myths About Israel and Palestine. That was a video that I made and post it to the channel. If you haven't seen the video, hang out here now, but later on, go back and watch this video because I break down what I believe are five myths about Israel, Palestine. It was an attempt to get people to understand some of the misinformation and disinformation. And it was also an attempt to arm people with talking points and debate points so that they could better understand what's at stake with Israel and Palestine. So I posted that. And after posting that, uh, my five points, I got a tweet from Israel advocacy movement. And it said, Mark Lamont Hill just presented five myths about Israel. And these are my myths, more or less, right? It's not complicated. They've been fighting forever. It's not religious. Pro-Palestine uh, are anti-Semitic uh, and Palestinians don't want peace. I would say, I, slightly reductive of what I said on a couple of them, but that's, that, is the gen that, that, that is a good, spirited, fair representation of what I said. Uh, and we'll talk through them. Uh, he said, I challenge you to debate me on every one of these points. Not some of them, y'all. He said, I challenge you to debate me. I didn't know it was a he at the time. But I challenge you to debate me on every one of these points on your channel or mine. Uh, he said, on air, I won't just force you to concede some of these points, but to admit that it is more complicated than you claim to do you accept. Now, you know I want the smoke. Of course I wanted to accept so I immediately accepted. We went into the DM world, which you have to do because sometimes they're bots. Sometimes they're not real people. Sometimes it's crazy stuff, right? So I, we, we exchanged for a bit. I did some research. I found out that this is a man. It's a real human being, uh, a staunch pro-Zionist, a staunch pro-Israel voice. And I said, let's have that conversation. And so he quite bravely and nicely uh, is joining us today for a spirited engaged conversation slash uh, debate. Joseph Cohen, uh, founder of the Israel Advocacy Movement, joins us today. Joseph, good to see you. So first and foremost, thank you for the, the accepting the challenge. I believe in these dark days, it's really, really important to have dialogue. You don't make, and I'm not calling you my enemy here, um, but you don't make peace with your friends. You make peace with your enemies. And the only way you make piece is by first listening and understand what is coming from the other side and then presenting your narrative and hopefully finding that middle ground. Um, I've actually made several videos about you in the past. If oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> and they've always focused on tweets. And I think when you're responding to a tweet or a short video, you it's not a fair representation of that person because you don't give them the opportunity to respond to your charge. And so this is why I felt this is a really, this would be a really good opportunity for me, one, to understand who you are as a person, but two, challenge some of the misconceptions I believe you have. And thirdly, maybe take something away from you as well, because every time I engage with someone who's advocating for the Palestinian state, while I'm advocating for Israel, I tend to learn something because every person has a different perspective and different information that's led them to where they are. So looking forward to this one. Hopefully we can both grow. Uh, ho hopefully. Um, so let's start with the, the first point that I made, uh, that it's not complicated. Now, I know you watched the video, so you know that I offered some, ironically, some, some complexity to that point, right? I didn't just say it's not complicated, it's simple. I said that there are all sorts of complexities attached to this issue from uh, issues around what it means to return, issues around sovereignty, issues around indigeneity, there's lots of issues. I mean, after over after more than a century of, of struggle here, Israel Palestine is certainly complicated at this philosophical level, at the moral level, uh, at the legal level. There's lots of complexities here. But my point was and remains that complexity is often used as a way of sidestepping some very fundamental and basic realities here. And it's those fundamental and basic realities that I'm saying are more significant. And, and ultimately, I would say trump any of the intellectual complexities that may be attached to this to this battle. 
Um, and so, yeah, I'll, I'll give you the first attempt to kind of engage that idea. And I, I want to get a sense of what, what you're thinking about that. So, so that I don't misrepresent your position, if it is simple, would you be able to condense it to one sentence? What it is that you're actually saying in that it's not complicated? What is the simple one liner? Yeah. Um, at the end of the 19th century, a movement of, uh, it's going to be a long sentence, but it'll be a, a, it'll be an academic sentence, but it'll be a sentence. At the end of the at the end of the nineteenth century, beginning at the end of the nineteenth century, there was a a large scale, relatively large scale, n- Jewish nationalist movement to return to to go to, uh, and ultimately settle in uh, the region that I would call historic Palestine. Um, and while those people have some religious, cultural, and uh, historic ties to that land, and certainly there's been an a nonstop, uninterrupted presence there. This was largely a movement, not entirely, but largely a movement of of European Jewish immigrants at that time um, to the land uh, and their immigration into the land ultimately led to the dispossession of the people who were living there at the time. Okay, Um, so I I assume that would be the the argument, but I didn't want to misrepresent your position. So I would like to argue and undermine that entire statement because you start the clock at a particular point in history, but then ignore all the history that was prior to that. So I'm going to roll back a little bit further. Yeah. Um, there's, there's going to be no contest on the ancient history of the Jews in the land. I'm, I'm sure of that. Um, and what I would say with the Roman revolt, um, the Jews were banished from from Jerusalem. So this would have been around 2000 years ago. They then emigrated to the north of the country um, to northern Israel, so the Galilee, that sort of area. And they established some of the most important religious schools that the Jewish people have known. They wrote great works like the Jerusalem Talmud. They wrote incredible rabbis who wrote codifications of Jewish law that we use unto this day, like Yosef Cairo. And um, they lived in Israel just before the Islamic colonization of the land in the year 637 by Umar ibn al-Khattab, there was around 200 to 400,000 Jews living in the land. So there was a sizable community. And that community persisted right up until the 20th century where you started your counting. It diminished in numbers. There wasn't 400,000 by the the, the end of the Ottoman Empire. But there was a a Jewish majority in Jerusalem in 1844, according to Caesar Famine, who went on to be the the French consul. There was... um, sizable Jewish communities in places like Tzfat. Um, and so I think by starting the clock at the beginning of the 20th century and focusing only on political Zionism and the Jews that came from Europe, and that's absolute a fair portrayal of what happened, there were Jews that emigrated from Europe into, into Israel to escape persecution. It ignores the much older um, Jewish community was there, and it also ignores Arab migration into the land. In 1882, the Ottomans took a census. There were 270,000 um, Muslim Arabs living in the land. By 1945, when the British census the, took their census, the um, village statistics or the uh, report, they found that there was now 1.26 million Arabs living in the land. So there was a huge population explosion. Jews and Arabs moved into the land. Both people had always lived in the land. And what we're really dealing with here is do Jews have a right to sovereignty um, versus uh, at the expense of, I would assume you would say, the Arab communities. So would you say yeah, would you say that all of that complexity is still contained within your initial statement? A- absolutely. And I'll tell you why. Um, there are people who would dispute some of the history that you're offering. There would be people who would make a disconnection. And I want you to hear me out on this so that I not be misunderstood. There would be people who would say that there is a disconnect between the ancient Jewish populations, that the people who lived in the region before the destruction of the temple, before 70 CE, before the first destruction of the first temple, they would say that those people are not the same people biologically, culturally, ethnically as the people who are making the claim of sovereignty in the land now. If I were making that claim, then what you would raise would be relevant. 
It would be urgent. It would, it would undermine my claim that it's not complex. But I don't make that claim. I actually believe that that's an anti-Semitic claim. I happen to believe, I, I have no investment in questioning um, anyone's Jewishness, anyone's uh, genetic ties to the land, anyone's uh, religious or spiritual ties to the land. I, I, don't, I don't buy into the sadly reignited Khazar myth, uh, or, which has been disputed by all accounts that I've seen. Um, I've seen no intellectual, empirical, biological DNA. None of that stuff, uh, to me, it, it, there's no evidence of it, right? So because of all of that, the largely the, the ancient history that you're offering only substantiates a point that I don't dispute, which is that there is a longstanding and enduring Jewish presence and connection to the land. I've never disputed that. So all that history is, is, is largely respectfully irrelevant. I think the reason why the 100 year history matters for me is because as you pointed out, and I agree with you, Jews and Muslims and Christians have lived in the land forever. I don't mean literally forever, but they've lived there for a very long time. It's, it's, that's not in dispute. Um, and the primary, um, there, there, are, there are fights, there are battles, there are tensions, you know, no place is idyllic. But the type of struggle that we begin to see, as you pointed out correctly, in 1882, at the beginning of the first Aliyah, that, from that moment forward, right, which is where I'm beginning the clock, the reason why that is the starting point is because that is the starting point of political Zionism. And, and, and political Zionism, not cultural Zionism, not any other form of Zionism. I have no problem with people having a spiritual or, or, or cultural connection to a land. I have no problem with people doing whatever they want. Um, the issue is the, the, the political Zionism because that was a form of settler colonialism. And that begins, and I know I know you don't like the, the S word, but 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 settler colonialism begins at the end of the 19th century. And because for me, that is the actual problem, it would make no sense for me to to debate the Romans or to debate the previous the previous empires where again Jews undoubtedly lived. I have no I have no dispute about that. Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense. Um, and first and foremost, I appreciate you not strawmanning my position and representing and playing it back fairly. And what I, I would like to, to now address is go into some of the, the things that you mentioned. So first I'd break in with, I'm not talking about the ancient community. I'm talking about the continuous community that never left. I've got a very good friend of mine whose family lived in Gaza until they were expelled in 1949 by the Egyptians. There have all, there's been a continuous Jewish presence and what we're effectively First dealing all, with, you, you'd agree that you'd agree that by the end, you, you mentioned the Ottoman census of 1882, but by the 1890s, I mean the the standard the, the standard academic, at least that I know of, uh, demography of of Palestine had the the Jewish population around five percent. Then is it, you, you it, wouldn't it, it, it was around ten percent, um, but yeah, give up. It, it's certainly yeah, but, not the majority. Just, but, but right, but it was yeah. a very small number. Okay, so I want to be very clear. Yeah, because you no. mentioned that the Palestinian population was two hundred thousand, which could lead someone to believe. But, but there was something comparable with the Jewish population. Here's the, the rub. The reason the Jewish community had been diminished from half a million effectively at the beginning of the Islamic conquest and growing in different sizes at different points was because of persecution and colonization. Zionism is an anti-colonial movement. We, fight, we fought the, the British colonizers and we brought, fought the Arab colonizers. In 1948, um, so let's actually, before we go to the 48 war, let's just backpedal a slight bit and... I think it's really important to establish the it's, the demographics that we have today are millions and millions of people. Back then, we're talking less than 300,000 people. The, there was very few people living in the land at all, be they Jewish, be they Arab. Um, there was mass immigration to the land in the, the fall of the colonial empire of the Ottomans. So the, the collapse of the Ottoman Empire um, effectively and the, 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 the moving into the land of the, the Zionists who bankrolled almost all of the infrastructure that you saw being built at the beginning of the period that you're talking about, um, you saw huge immigration of Jews and Arabs. The, the surnames of the, the Palestinian people give away their origins. al Masri. The, the Egyptian, Al Saud, the Saudi, Al Maghrebi, the Moroccan, the, the North African, and Mohammed Al Kurd, Al Kurd, 
was that from, <laughs> guess where, Kurdistan. So you had massive immigration of both people and you had a much smaller um, community of people that never left the land, be they Arabs or Jews. Um, there were ancient Arab communities as well. It wasn't, many people think that the Arabs only came with Umar ibn al-Khattab in 637. You had communities like the Nabataeans in the, in the south towards Jordan. And so you've had Jews and Arabs continuously in the land in very small numbers. But then you saw a population explosion that is unparalleled for anywhere else in the Middle East at that time in this geography, because both communities for different reasons were attracted. Jews ideologically and religiously in some cases, and Arabs economically. Um, that was what was driving the majority of Arab immigration during the period we're talking about. And so what I want to try and establish is can you see the complexity there that you have two you have the collapse of the ottoman empire ultimately which leaves a power vacuum and two communities that have both lived in the land in relatively small numbers but then rapidly expanding and then both um having fair claims to statehood and both vying for statehood that that's my argument that's the complexity two people both in the land both want some sort of sovereignty and neither really um being able to compromise on the other's claims. Yeah, I would, I would disagree with significant parts of that representation. Um, nothing that you said is untrue, but it's the missing parts that would make one read too much into that. For example, yes, the number you said the numbers were relatively small. I agree, it's a fact, right? Relatively small compared to to now, sure, or even to the middle part of the twentieth century, even by the time. The League of Nations is formed or the UN is formed. We're talking about much larger numbers. However, um, the Palestinian population was dramatically, extraordinarily, and if you want to not, I don't want to quibble over the word Palestinian. So we, let's just say for now, the Arab population, the Arab population of the region at that time was dramatically, overwhelmingly the majority. It wasn't even close. Again, by the end of the 19th century, we're talking about a, maybe a 5% population of 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 jews um and that's including some who had arrived in the first aliyah but obviously as you know didn't fare so, often didn't fare so well up in, up until um 1904 so um it's not as if there's these two small pockets of people or 1903 that, that they, it's not as if there are these two small pockets of people who are now vying for statehood that's the first point i would say that there are palestinian people on the land who are now encountering a wave of, of European immigration for very specific, and we'll get to this, I think, later, political, I would argue, much more than religious purposes. But regardless of their reason, they're arriving in the land and they are disrupting the status quo and the norm. I don't mean that in a pejorative sense. I mean, in all, in all I'm just saying that it, it shifted the demographics, it shifted the, the civil, and, 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 and it, it, sh it shifted the order of things. Um, you said both were vying for statehood. I would push back against this idea of statehood. You know, at at w at the end of the Ottoman period, you know, we were still a, a world of empires, and so and so the idea of the state or the nation state was 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 nascent at best, and 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 I would argue it hasn't really even come to fruition yet. We part of the 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 the. Uh, one of the enduring legacies of the post World War I period and certainly the interwar period is the emergence of the nation state and a commitment to protecting nation states. You'd agree with that, I think. So 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 I I, I wouldn't say that they both had commitments to to the land. I would also add that even to the extent that the 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 early issue or the, the early um sort of pre-nation state Jewish community that was there, to the extent that they wanted a homeland or a state, and I do think they wanted a state, I think you're right about that. That's not what the Palestinians were necessarily interested in. Um, because there was no need for that. Th just like there was no need to, to secure private land ownership because there was a, 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 a Musha, a Mus Musha Ottoman land system. In other words, it, it, the idea of private land and this is my land and only my land and I own it and no one else can have it was again, a relatively new idea. You know, 70% of, of, of the land going into this period was, was kind of publicly owned and shared land. So the idea of a state, the I, idea of private kind of these sort of pre-capitalist or modern capitalist, excuse me, um, 
ideas of ownership. These were all new things that weren't tied to Palestinians. They were just living there. And Palestinians didn't have an issue with Jews in the land. They didn't have an issue with sharing the land. The issue was that the, the, the political Zionist wave, and then I, I'll give it back to you, the issue was that the political Zionist wave here didn't just want a homeland as one would read from the Balfour Declaration. It wasn't just a Jewish homeland. It was a Jewish state, a state that was bound and connected to a very particular ethnic and national identity. So it became a state that was formed, as you rightly pointed out, or at least rightly alluded to my perspective, at the expense of the Palestinian people. So it's not, if, if, if Jews just come to the land in, in, in a wave and live there and share the land like they always had, this wouldn't be an issue. The issue was that, they, that, that it was a formation of a Jewish state that then did the opposite of what the Balfour Declaration suggested, which was that it did disrupt the religious and civil rights of those people who were nameless <laughs> in the Balfour Declaration that we now call Palestinians. And I think that's a perfect segue into the for right, fighting forever um, comment. So I okay. think your framing- let me, just, let me just note that Let me just note that for the audience. I just want them to know we, we're now moving to another one just because this can get complicated. So we've just debated number one. We're going to jump to number two now that they have been fighting forever. I made the case that it is not, a, that it is a historical inaccuracy and a myth. And I think, frankly, both anti-Palestinian, anti-Arab and anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic to suggest that these are two barbaric people who've been warring and fighting forever, that this, that these bad, the struggle over Palestine, and I'm using Palestine in the historic sense, right? In all of historic Palestine, um, has, a, has a start date. And hopefully, inshallah, I'll have an end date. But I, I, I'm going to give the floor to you. And I'm paying attention to the comments, and they're saying we're just moving on. Um, oh, we can't go see? forever. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So, yeah, I, I'm responding to a comment that's saying, so we're just moving on. We've said we've got an hour, and we've got five points to get through. So I'm going to link into what's just been said, but bring us into the next comment. So the key, the, your, your entire argument, um, which you just presented, rests on Jewish and Arab coexistence in the land prior to the state. I agree with you that the Arabs weren't vying for statehood. They were, at, depending where they sat, either looking for caliphate or some sort of pan-Arab project, depending where we were in the history and who we were discussing, because there was a variety of opinion amongst the Arabs that lived in the land. And I want to illustrate what the actual condition of Jews living in that land was. And I'm not going to go beyond the borders of what we would call modern day um, Israel. I'm not going to include um, mandatory Palestine, which would have included Jordan, Jordan. but just deal with um, Israel, the West Bank, Gaza. Um, Jews have existed as a second class citizen in different Islamic khulafa, caliphates. And depending on the caliph would determine the condition that the Jews lived in but they were always living under the condition that they should pay the jizya until they are sagirun. Sagirun, this is um, an ayah in the Quran, a verse from the Quran, which is you fight them until they're willingly submitted um, and fully humiliated or humbled. And so when the Jews were living under the Ottomans, when the Jews were living under the Seljuks, when the Jews were living under the Mamluks, when the Jews were living under any of the different empires that existed and colonized, they were the colonizing forces of the land, and I'm going to go into that, um, the Jews were oppressed. Not every caliph oppressed the Jews, but even the best of the caliphs, the Jews living under them, would talk of the oppression. So in um, around the, the beginning of the 11th century, Al-Hakim massacres the community of Jerusalem, burns the synagogues, forces the Jews to wear a golden calf around their neck to show that they were idolaters, humiliating them. Um, in 1517, there's a, what we often find is multiple massacres. So like, if you take something like 1517 and 1834, there were massacres in Hebron, in Tzfat, Safed. There were massacres in Jaffa. And Jews were raped and murdered and put to the sword when they were living within this land. So the, the idea that they haven't been fighting forever is not true. The Jews weren't capable of fighting back, but they were massacred. They were raped, they were tortured, they, they were, had some of the greatest oppressions inflicted upon them when they were living in the land. And so to the, what we're effectively dealing with in the beginning of the 20th century is Jews from the Middle East and Europe saying, Khalas, no more. 
We've been persecuted. We've been under the boot of the colonizers for centuries. The Christians have oppressed us. The Muslims have oppressed us. The, not at this point, but in later in history, the atheists would oppress us. And we have a right, as much as any other people in this land, to statehood. And to frame it that we haven't been fighting is because the Jews were powerless, but we were oppressed and we were persecuted and we were um, put to the sword by many of the caliphates that conquered the land. With all due respect, this feels a little like a straw man. I, I, you, you've just made a persuasive argument that anti-Semitism runs throughout history and that Jews have been, that, that's an argument that I never disputed. I, I've never disputed that. Point number two was whether the struggle over the land of Palestine has been going on forever. And you pointed to fights in the Hejaz struggles, indeed, in, or, or not in the Hejaz, excuse me, th 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 but you said throughout the Middle East, um, as well it, as it, in- That was all in Israel. Everything I mentioned was just in Jerusalem, places like that. Sorry, just to be clear. I could have gone to many more from other caliphates. So when, when, you were when you were talking about the, 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 the caliphates, you said all of the caliphates. The first caliphate wouldn't be in Jerusalem. The first caliphate would be where? No, no, sorry. I'm talking about the caliphates that control Jerusalem, but you could go, you could go to other caliphates okay, okay, as well, because, but just, I don't like it. Sorry, just okay, to be clear. I... Okay, because in, in typically within this body of work, when we first talk about the, the, the caliphates or the khalifa, we, we begin with Abu Bakr or we begin with Ali, which don't begin in Jerusalem. So so I, I assumed, I thought you meant it in the sort of global Islamic context of saying that, but... Neither here, either, either here, neither here nor there, right? Ultimately, I don't disagree with you that Jews have been persecuted throughout history. I would argue that that, that anti-Semitism is largely a European invention that's then exported, you know. But, but I, but I, but I, and and, and really a Christian in, in, in invention. Um, but we we can we can we can say we can save that for a different debate if you, if you don't mind, just because that will be a whole other conversation. Um, and and I don't I don't I think it's tangential to the fundamental point. Uh, that I think we're agreeing on, right? I agree that there's a long-standing <laughs> uh, world of anti-Semitism, whether it's Spain, whether it's France, whether it's Ukraine, Russia, Poland, or you know, we've also seen uh, Jewish isolation, oppression, etc., in in what is now the geographic and political Middle East. You get no, I'm I'm not disagreeing with that. That was that's, that wasn't what was in dispute. So maybe number two was a misunderstanding. The cl the claim that I was making is that there are people who wrongly believe that the struggle over the land, the struggle over Israel and Palestine in terms of the ownership of the land, the ruler ruling of the land, the control of the land, the sovereignty in the land, it, is, it for, is, a, is a forever struggle. P it, 500 years ago, there was no struggle between Arabs and Jews for the land. Th that struggle begins in the 20th century. I'm not saying that there weren't battles. I'm not saying there wasn't infighting. I'm not saying that there wasn't persecution. I, I, th I think we're making a a very. I, I think we're talking past each other on this point. The 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 the, 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 the and, and I'll explain just one more piece of it. I think you'll get what I'm saying. At the core, what I the reason why I made that that point in the myth series was because there are people who believe that that what we're seeing right now in Gaza, what we're seeing in the West Bank, what we're seeing in Israel, what we're seeing in the Golan, that what we've been seeing since 1948 or even since the early part of the 20th century, that that, that 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 didn't just start, that's been an ongoing nonstop thing. And that's just not historically true. I mean, I don't think even the most ardent Zionist historian would say that the battles that we're seeing have been going on for hundreds of years nonstop. Persecution has happened. Pogroms have happened. I mean, all kinds of stuff have happened. Ugly, awful, inexcusable stuff. I'm just saying that that's a that's a conversation that we should have, and it's a serious one. But that's not the same conversation as a conversation about the struggle for a Jewish homeland, or the struggle for statehood, or the struggle um, of of a nationalist movement. That, that, that's a different thing, and that, that's what I was talking about. So uh, again, maybe I think we just see the world through a very different um, through different eyes, through different glasses, different lens. Um, for me. If my community are living in the land and we are being attacked by armies who are putting us to the sword, who are burning our buildings and we're doing our best to repel them, um, and we are not in a position to gain any sort of independence because we're against mighty empires, the biggest empires of the day, but we are still in conflict in that land, 
and we are still being oppressed in that land. It's not as simple as just saying this is like anti-Semitism. Um, some th this is violence. This is being carried out by armies, and there are Jewish forces that are trying their best to repel those attacks. Can, can, can I ask a clarifying question? Just just because yeah. I, I just want just because I want to make sure. So, are you saying that when the first Zionist wave of immigration happened, right? The first Aliyah. Are you saying that at the same time that 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 Jewish or Zionist specifically Zionist waves were coming into historic Palestine and into Ottoman Palestine? You're saying at that time that there were armies fighting Jews and oppressing Jews, and that the Jews were trying to withstand it. No, no. So the Tel Hai would be the, the Battle of Tel Hai would be the first um, battle, which would have been in 1920. Then in 1921 was the second. Uh, in terms of, and these aren't battles though. It's called the Battle of Tel Hai, but Arab militias came and massacred Jews in the the um, Nabi Musa massacre or the Nabi Musa riots, depending which side of the the fence right. was sitting. Um, Jews were massacred by a, a mob screaming for the death of Jews. Um, but the Jews weren't a military force at this point, yet you would describe that as the communities fighting. What the Jews were trying to do at that point, just like they were trying to do in the 16th century and the 19th century and any of the centuries where they were persecuted, is repel those attacks. So the Jews were not in a position, the Jewish people as a collective, were not in a, in a position in the 1500s to establish a state. But we were fighting on that land and we were fighting for our right to exist on that land. That's what I'm arguing. Right. And I'm making, and again, every argument you're making, I'm not disputing. This is, I think we're talking past each other. I, I'm, 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 I'm talking about a very specific set of struggles over very, anyway, let, let, let's move on just for time's sake. I mean, I'm happy to stay here, but I, I, I don't, I don't think we're disagreeing with each other. I think we're, I think we're framing, I think we're talking about two very different issues and using the same framing, but. Okay. So let's move on to a religious conflict then. Yeah. So, so y'all, the, 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 the other point here was that uh, it is not religious. It's not religious. Now, again, again, for context, I never argued that there was no religious dimension. You, you saw the video, so you know that I'm, I'm, I'm not saying anything different now. Uh, what I argued was is that, the, that this is not a religious struggle, that this is not fundamentally and primarily a religious struggle. There are religious elements to it, for sure. Um, there are things that have become even more significant now on the religious front that I think have been politicized. But at the core of this struggle, I do not, th this is not a fight over religion. This is not a battle over uh, different interpreta interpretations of the Quran or the, or the Torah. This is not a fight over whose religion is better. This is not a desire to keep people off the land because they're of a different faith. Um, this is not fundamentally a religious struggle. Um, again, I'm not saying, for example, that the struggle over Jerusalem doesn't matter. Of course it does, right? Um, when you look at some of the the riots that you talk about, we could talk about. Uh, you mentioned Nebi Musa in 1920. Um, that wasn't a religious struggle. Uh, I would argue that that was. I mean, if if you look at the British, I mean, you may not trust the British commissions, but if you read the the British papers the, after every riot, I'm saying this for the audience's benefit. I'm sure you know this. After every riot or massacre, there was some kind of inquiry, some kind of a white paper, some kind of commission, some kind of assessment, and Largely, uh, the fight over the Nebi Musa riots, according to the Palin inquiry that I understand, I've read every word of it, um, was that they ruled that it was uh, the response to Arab dissatisfaction with the failure uh, to offer so Arab self-determination, that it was a response to the failed fulfillment of the Balfour Declaration to protect their religious and civil rights, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but you may have a different interpretation of it. I'd love to hear your interpretation of those commissions. Or you could say, I don't trust those commissions. That's your right. But it's, it certainly wouldn't be the dominant narrative, the dominant diplomatic position at the time in the 19, in 1920, certainly is what I'm saying. You could disagree because nation states are wrong. Countries are wrong. Empires are wrong. So you, I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not saying it's right because they said it, but I, I think it's, it's worth noting that what I'm saying is sort of within the context of what everyone, the dominant narrative. But I, I want to hand this back to you. Um, but I, I, again, my fundamental point here is not that it doesn't matter for, re, that religion doesn't matter in this struggle, but um, the wave of Zionist immigration that comes, and even the father of modern day Zionism, modern political Zionism, Theodore Herzl, these were not religious fanatics. These were not, re these weren't, these weren't, I would argue, many of them weren't, were secular Jews. I mean, you know, this. they were secular Jews. Some were atheists. You know, some were, their orientation to, to, to the idea of God was uh, cultural more than it was theological. 
um, it was social more than it was, you know, an investment in the actual belief in, 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 in another being. And because Jewish identity isn't just religion, which is another, I think, dangerous myth, but that it is a cultural identity, it is a national identity, it is an ethnic identity, that all those things get bound up together. And so the idea that say that, well, if, if, if Jews are struggling with Arabs, then it's a religious struggle just because these people are identifying as Jewish, I think is to misread how complex and nuanced jewelry is and Jewishness is. Um, so that's my argument. I want to hear, I want to hear what, what you say. So oh, and, and let me pause you one more thing. We have 15 minutes left. Can I steal 10 more minutes from you? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We may, we may get interrupted, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's fine. I, I, I know baby life well, so. <laughs> um, so what I begin with is I'm going to respond directly to um, your your position that you presented in the, the video and what you've just said now. Um, yeah. I'll start with some amusing things that, I, that tickled me in the video um, and I'll share it with the audience without sharing my screen because I know we're, we're, we don't have your stuff today. Um, but in the video, you try to describe how Palestine was always, or the Palestinians were a, a diverse people. They were Christians, they were Arabs, they were Jews. And you presented some, some Palestinian Jews, except it was the Zionist Federation of Iran, they were Palestinian, and behind it it said Zion. Zion. Um, it was, and it just goes to show how easily for me people that um, can get misled on both sides. Um, so you pull, you probably typed in Palestinian Jew somewhat in the I Google. mean, it's my editor. I, I, I don't, I, I don't pull oh, the ball. Okay, apologies, yeah. apologies. There, yeah, yeah, yeah. The editor dropped the ball on that one. But the yeah. the ultimate charge is today: eighty five percent of the Palestinians are Muslims. This that you referenced the 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 twentieth uh, the the riots in the nineteen twenties and up to the forties that would have been under religious leadership. Yes, there were Christians in there. I agree. Just as there's fifteen percent of the Palestinians today are Christian. Christians have Christians have been a minority minority and a shrinking minority amongst the Palestinians. But they were led by people like Hajj Amin al Husseini, who was religious. Even in forty eight, when the secular nations like the Jordanians they rallied the people under the pretext of jihad. Hajimin al Husseini famously rallied the Muslims under the, the battle cry, O oh Muslim, Muslim, I declare a jihad, slaughter the Jews, slaughter them all. But none of that's my argument. My argument for why this is a religious conflict is for the very reason you and I are discussing it today. And it comes down to one location it comes down to Masjid al Aqsa, Hahabayat, the Temple Mount. This is why it's on our radar. If you ask anyone about the conflict in the Central African Republic, they won't be able to tell you a thing. You ask them about Yemen, and most people will struggle to talk about what's happening in Yemen, despite the death toll being considerably higher and prolonged than what's going on here. The reason the world is focused on Israel and Palestine is one word, and that's well, three words, Masjid al-Aqsa. Um, the entire Muslim world looks at Quds. They look at al -Aqsa. The Jewish world looks at Jerusalem. The Christian world does the same thing because it is so intertwined with our faiths. So my argument is the reason why you and I are talking about it, the reason why the entire Muslim world rejected Israel when it declared independence in 48 was because it was a Jewish and not a Muslim state. That's why when the Muslim leaders rallied their people, they did it under the banner of jihad and not a secular nationalist war. So my argument is from that, the inception, from the, from the beginning of the fighting to today, the catalyst was religion, and the thing that keeps it in the spotlight is the religious significance of Jerusalem. Again, sorry, I had my mute on. Um, again, that, that is a, uh, a compelling argument. Again, although, I, we seem to be replicating a pattern of arguing, disputing points that I'm not making, right? You just made a persuasive case for why the world is invested in the struggle over Israel and Palestine. I think you're right. I think the Muslim world is invested in Israel and Palestine over, over, over that. But I never said that people's investment in Israel and Palestine wasn't religious. I didn't say that. I would make just the opposite case. I, I'm actually just finished a, a 10, a eight year research project on Afro-Palestinians. Um, and one of the things we talk about is how many people join the Arab Liberation Army, the Arab Salvation Army, um, even from the even from West Africa, partly as a as a as a as a as a 
global Islamic movement. Now, I would argue. Just to that point, what was their logo? Do you know? Uh, uh, you yeah, the, the, star and the, crescent? the initial one was a star and a crescent. No, it was a star of David with a dagger through it because it was Jewish versus Arab, Jewish versus Muslim, effectively. That, that wasn't their initial. That wasn't their initial logo. But I, but I, 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 we can again. If you if you look in the archive, you see that's not their initial logo. But let me put a pin on that, just because again, I don't want to get sidetracked. We again, we could get sidetracked on that. Um, the point is, everything you just said is saying why people are more passionate, more invested, more committed to paying attention to this thing over here. Let's say you are one hundred percent right, right? Let's say I conceded all of that. I don't, but let's say I conceded all of that. That still wouldn't undermine the point that I'm making, which is that Israelis and Palestinians or Jews and Arabs or Jews and Palestinians are not, that their fight is not primarily a religious one. I'm not talking about why people pay attention to it, why people fight, why people advocate, why people are allies. That's a different question. You know? Um, I can't hear you. I don't know. Oh, in, in, I think I just hit a button. In terms of uh, Masjid al-Aqsa, Masjid al-Aqsa is a very important religious site. It's the first Qibla. It's the first place toward which toward Muslims pray. But it's the third most, it's the third most uh, holy mosque in uh, in Islam. So this is this is an important thing, right? Um, it's important, but it's not the it's not the primary issue here. Um, also, I think your comment ignores the pan-Arabist movement of the, 19, of, the, of the 19th and 20th century, right? And not, there's both there's the pan-Arab movement and then there's the Arabist movement, two separate and distinct movements of which there was a commitment to a kind of Arab nationalism that wasn't just bound up in, um, in religiosity, but a kind of collective, a, a, a collective, they may argue anti-imperialist by the time Gamal Abdel Nasser is involved in it. You could even argue anti-capitalist, other things movement, but the, the, the point of it was that they weren't just fighting, um, they weren't just fighting to defend Islam. They were fighting to defend land. They were fighting to protect themselves from outside threats. But when you look inside again of, 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 um, of, of historic Palestine, when, when, when Zionist immigration happens, people were not upset because Jews were coming to the land. And when you look at the, again, when you look at all the white papers, when you look at all the, the, the Peel Commission, the Taft Commission, and you look at all of these, all of the, ter the determinations that the outside observers made, and at this point, those outside observers weren't pro-Arab. I think you, we would agree at that point, certainly not in the, in the first quarter of the 20th century. They argued that they're, this is not a religious fight. They argued that these people aren't fighting because there's Jews in the land. They're fighting because they're losing land. They're fighting because they're losing employment opportunities. They're, they're fighting because they're not able, that they're, that they're being um, dispossessed of their land. If Palestinians, if a, if a Muslim, if a wave of Muslim immigration had happened in 1882 and they had come and done the exact same thing, the Palestinians would have resisted in the exact same way. This wasn't about religion. That's my point. Now, you're right. Masjid al-Aqsa and, and, and the, um, the entire kind of compound, the Aqsa compound, is a religious site. And it is something that is fought over. Even to this day, the, the, the status quo in Jerusalem is a very shaky ground. Every time you go to Jerusalem, every time I go to Jerusalem, you see how shaky it is. You see how precarious a situation it is. The, the fight over Jerusalem as a capital is an important thing, but it's as much a political fight as a religious fight. But what I'm saying, I, again, I'm not ignoring the religious dimensions. I'm not even ignoring the fact that groups like Hamas are 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 is, are, 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 uh, are waging a, a form of a battle in the name of a kind of political Islam. I'm not disputing that either. What I, I, again, I'm not saying there's no religious dimension to this. I'm saying though that this is ultimately a settler colonial struggle. If every Jew who came from from around the world to Palestine had been secular and atheist, the Palestinian response would have been the same. If they had said, we're not invested in the Wailing Wall or the Church of the Sepulchre or, or, or Aqsa Mosque, the, 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 the fight would have been the same. This is not about religion. This is about, this is about settler colonial land, land occupation and theft. That, that, that's all, and ethnic cleansing. And all, of the, all the words you're hearing are, aren't about religion. They're, 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 they're about settler colonialism. And I, and I think to reduce it to a, um, a religious fight Again, almost makes 
both Jews and Arabs sound primitive and bound up in in these kind of pre-modern commitments to to stuff that's not concrete or real or democratic or bound up in law. This there's we don't need scripture for this. There's international law for this. Um, I think that at the end of the day is the case. But I, I know I went long, so please take as, as long as you need to respond. Okay, so I would like to, I'm not going to do it now, but I would like to, before I log off, address the settler colonial um, libel that you keep throwing out there, and we will get to that. But mm. I'll stick on religion for now. So I think I, when I debate people, when I talk to people, I try to be as charitable as I can. And what I would like to say is I think I can agree with you that there was definitely nationalist um uh, the, the the earlier the early jews the early jewish zionists were motivated um out of a desire primarily to um relieve the jewish people of anti-semitism um, yeah. and that was the big motivation we've been persecuted and persecuted we were currently being persecuted and we were looking for a way to end that um we had one place where we had any claim to a nation and that was israel um there'd been a continuous presence there we were sovereign over that land for millenn for, for over a thousand years on or off give or take um we so we we believe and you will challenge this and we can debate that <laughs> maybe another day but we had a claim to this this land now the opposition to jews being on that land was religious that's what i'm saying so when you listen and you read the language of the muslim leaders of that time the language they employed then and today was religious they weren't talking about a nationalist struggle they were talking about jihad jihad jihad, like, ooh, jihad. can you just give me an example just so i Hajim can Hussein, I just, I just gave you Hajim al Hussein, the, the king of jordan no that many 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 um different we were like abdullah abdullah is as secular as they come yet he used the term jihad to to rally the his people behind him and I, that's Benny Morris, if you want the source for the jihad. I can't remember which of his books. Um, but their religion was at the heart of this. The opposition was to Jews, Jews who are al Kitab. They are one of the Dhimma. They are supposed to be under. They are not supposed to have a state. The opposition was to Jews having a state. The Arabs that came into the land, they weren't opposed. The Arabs that came, there's, there's no question. Like, people will question the Jews that come from Yemen, but not the Arabs that came from Morocco. And so there was mass immigration of, of all people, and the opposition was because they were Jews. And the, the overwhelming majority of the population was Muslim. The, the, the Arab population was Muslim then and Muslim today. And you cannot remove that from the equation. I agree with you, the Jews were majority secular, um, back then, there was still a large religious section, particularly those that, that, that came in the first earlier. Um, but the, 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 the Muslims were a religious community. The entire society had been structured around religious um, models, from how taxation did, how the land was ruled, what, what the position of the different people within the land. The Jews were supposed to be one of the Dhimma. You can't escape that. That is the history. And the Dhimma or the Dhimmi had thrown off the yoke of the caliphate effectively and was on the land now saying we are an equal and we are entitled to be to self-govern just as you are equal as um, entitled to self-govern and so and this, the final thing I would say is today the conflict is 100% about religion the reason you and I are focused on it today is because of religion the reason it's in the media is because of religion if this was happening in Africa nobody like our social media would not be consumed by it because there have been far bloodier and more horrific conflicts in Africa, which Europe turned away from for a variety of reasons. The reason the world focuses on this and keeps this conflict alive and front of mind for the entire globe is because of religion. Then, then, why, then why aren't they invested in Sudan? Why aren't they invested in, in, in sectarian squabbles in, in, you know, in the Middle East or in South Asia? Well, if 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 it's the re if it's a religious tension that gets people going, then 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 why not those areas? But that's exactly the point. It is not in those. If they understand what you're saying, there isn't an interest in Sudan. There's barely an interest in. No, I'm saying those are. But, but I'm saying there are Muslims in the north and Christians in the south. No, no, no. You mean it's, it's not that they are Muslim. It's that the Jews are sovereign over. It's the only non-Muslim like okay. state in the region. Okay, okay, okay. So what you're you let me 
hone in more on what you're, you're you're not saying that it's religious you're saying that it's because it's jews i'm saying it's not it's jews and the location itself is of huge importance to muslims so it's not just the jews established the state in um kenya or argentina not uh, or let's go to a, a muslim country or uh, the jews established a country in syria it's because the jewish people who are supposed to be al kitab um, one of the people of the book that is supposed to be a citizen of the caliphate are not just sovereign over land that they believe is Muslim, but the third holy site, in your words, of Islam. So if the fight over Israel and Palestine were purely reduced or limited to Jerusalem, your point would probably be more persuasive to me. Um, Jerusalem as a final status question is certainly a significant one. But the fact the the battle over um, Israel and Palestine extends far beyond, and I would say isn't even primarily about Jerusalem. It's about the entire. It's about it's about the entire land. I mean, Jerusalem is a big deal, huge deal, but it's it's not the primary one. And again, we we probably won't agree on this. Uh, we clearly won't agree on this particular point. Um, but I I think part of the challenge is that when Jewishness is framed by the Jewish state as an ethnic identity, as a national identity, right? The Zionist movement is a nationalist movement. It's an ethnic identity, it's a national identity, it's a religious identity, it's a cultural identity. And so if a wave of Jewish immigrants come and dispossess Palestinian people, and they say that we are resisting, Pal we're resisting Jewish uh, occupation or Jewish colonialism or Jewish oppression or whatever word you wanna enter there, to say that then that that it's a religious one, to me is is problematic because it presumes that people are re, people are resisting the occupation because of its Jewishness, as if Palestinians would somehow have been less resistant if she she Muslim, uh, Muslims had done it, or if Sunni Muslims had done it, or if uh, Ahmadiyya Muslims had done it. And I'm saying there's no that 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 is a historical counterfactual. All we could do is speculate about that. But what we do know is that throughout the history of, of of there have been Jews, there have been Arab Jews there in particular, who were who were who were perfectly um not perfectly, let me not use that word because I don't want people to get hung up on the word perfectly, who who um who lived there in relative peace and without and, and 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 without generally without conflict. The issue wasn't that Jews were in Palestine. The issue was the Zionist movement which came to take over and dispossess the people who were there fundamentally. And again, after every uprising, after every battle, after every massacre, after every major incident of violence, when they did research, when they did studies, when they did investigations, when the British did this, the British colony did this, um, yeah, they found the same thing. They said, this wasn't about religion. This was about immigration. This was about the impact of immigration on the, on the pre-existing population. And yes, you, you point to uh, a couple of people um, and then we can move to, to, to another one because I know I know we got to go. Um, El Hajj Amin Al Husseini was the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. He wasn't the leader of the Palestinian people. He was the Grand. He was he was no no. But let me be very clear about what that means. Right? You're pointing to a a re, a religious figure who it it would be like if I were. I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to paint a a, a fair, uh, intellectually honest comparison in the United States. My point is. El Hajjim El Husseini was one of the notable families of Jerusalem. There's no doubt about that. Um, and he was the Grand Mufti, and he was incredibly influential and powerful. And he had a very specific vision for what uh, what the, what should happen to the land. And as time went on, it went from being a sort of a uh, strictly Islamist vision to a broader kind of greater Syria vision and a greater kind of pan-Arab vision uh, that was definitely not disconnected from Islam. I'm, I'm, I, you're shaking your head, but I'm actually, I think this is where I'm agreeing with you. I'm saying, I'm, I'm not saying that he wasn't a religious figure and that he didn't have religious visions and aspirations. I'm saying that, but you can't reduce uh, the Palestinian nationalist vision or the Palestinian political imagination to uh, uh, to the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem's vision. There were, you know, th th that, that's all I'm saying. But again, that's Jerusalem. But what about Yafo? What about, I mean, we, we, we could go around the land and say, look, people were, committed to holding on to their land and not being dispossessed of their land. And they didn't give a damn about Jewish identity as a religious identity.
I'm not saying there was never anti-Semitism. You know, that, that would be foolish. Um, but what I'm saying is the primary contention of, of the Palestinian people was we're losing our land to a group of, 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 of to, an, uh, to an immigration, a wave of immigration largely from Europe that is dispossessing us of our rights, our land, and our self-determination. Um, and then ultimately, a state was constructed that wasn't a religious state, right? The, 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 Israel's not a religious state. I think we could agree on that, right? It's, it's a secular uh, democratic state. I, I'm going to put it in quotes. You won't, but I'd say it's a secular democratic state, but it's also an ethno state. Um, and it's 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 the idea that a certain ethnic identity, in this case Jewishness, is the is the is the determining factor as to whether or not you have certain rights and privileges. That is what makes it an ethno state. Again, it's not religion. It's the fact that Jewishness, as an ethnic and national identity, is being prioritized over the indigenous Palestinian people. So, so a couple of things. First and foremost, he wasn't just the leader of Jerusalem. He was the leader of the Arab High Committee. He was effectively the Palestinian leader. He represented the Palestinians in the Arab League, etc. He was the de facto leader of the Palestinian people, certainly by the 1930s, uh, the end of the 1930s. Um, Le- you had okay. clashes with the Nashashibis, etc. But he became, with, uh, uncontestably, the, the, the leader of the Palestinian people. He was opposed by Abdullah. He was opposed by different people who wanted different ambitions for mandatory well, He was opposed by the Husseinis and the Khalidis as well. I mean, they were, they were, I'm just saying it wasn't, it, there wasn't a singular leader there any more than there was a singular leader of, 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 the, of the Yishuv. It, it just, I, it just, so, I think so we're, just, we're, just uh, rather than getting caught in the weeds, because I think we can argue, <laughs> like I could literally pick apart every single uh, thing. Okay. I, I'll just put one simple question to you. There was an, a non-local family was given, or a people was given 75% of British mandatory Palestine. And there was zero opposition to that. Zero opposition to a family from the Hejaz being awarded 75% of mandatory Palestine. And the reason there wasn't opposition was because they were Muslim Arabs. Had that been given to Jews, and I'm t- obviously for the audience, I'm talking about Jordan. Um, Jordan was 75% of mandatory Palestine. It was given to a family from the Hejaz, the Hashemites. And they rule it to this day. They are not Palestinian. They are not from the land. They are alien and they rule over it to this day. And there hasn't been opposition to that because they are Muslim Arabs that descend according to their tradition from Muhammad. Now, this is what, what, and I think we can probably go over this again and again, but the point is the opposition is not, you're, you're right. You could frame it as because of the Jews as an ethnic group, but Islam does not care about one's ethnicity. Islam cares about one's faith. Jew, many Muslims will tell you they're Arab Jews. I disagree, but fine. Why? Because they lived in Arab lands and spoke Arabic. But they, those that emigrated to the land, like the Yemenite Jews, and those that were already in the land that fought for independence, that wanted a Jewish state, were rejected because they were Jews, religiously and not Muslim. Do, do, do you see what I'm saying? The opposition to them... So, was so, 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 so you believe that the the people the, the Palestinians today are struggling over religion and not over land i believe it's both it's clearly both it's religion and land i'm saying that you can't remove the religion you cannot say this is not a religious conflict and and so I, I, again maybe we're getting hemmed up in 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 the weeds i again i it sounds like you're making a case for how religion is implicated in the struggle and I'm not what, what, I with say, what I would say, just to come back to the oh. first point, it's complicated. It's not that it's not a religious conflict, or it's not a conflict over land, or it's not a conflict over... It is all of those things. It is a religious conflict. The reason we are talking about it today is because of religion, more than anything else. And, and, and that's where we disagree. But remember, in the video, I said it's not primarily a religious struggle. That's why I say we, it's the, those, those slight words make, make a, a difference. I, I can see that in the video, I talked about Hamas. I talked about Jerusalem. I talked about the, the holy sites. But I said it's not primarily a religious struggle. And I don't think that any and, and the bulk of Palestinian nationalist movements, the, the bulk of Palestinian liberation movements have not focused on religion at all. And to the extent that they have, it's only been. No, I mean, you, you, you say the PFLP focused on re, primarily yeah, religion. The PFLP the Marxists, but even the Marxists, even the Marxist PFLP cry out Allahu Akbar as they buried axes in the Jewish rabbis, even even the Marxist PFLP. Yeah, but th- that doesn't make it a religious movement. No. Okay, I, I'm I'm agreeing with you. I'm saying the oh, people okay. are Marxist, but, but I'm saying even those Marxists, like within their ranks, are usually religious. 
Like they, 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 it's a fusion yeah. of religion and yeah. Marxism, but it's a separate argument. It's a separate argument. I, I disagree. I, disagree. I, I, I don't think declaring Allahu Akbar to make, is anyone's religion any more than when an atheist says, oh my God, it's hot outside that they've somehow contradicted their atheist claims. I mean, I think some things are just part of our cultural. And George Habash was very clear about him being sort of Christian here, Marxist here, and even Muslim in a certain way culturally, right? So that's why I say it, 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 it's not that. But let, let, let's keep going because I know we both got stuff to do. What I'll do, I'll save us time on the next one. Pro-Palestinians are anti-Semitic. I'm happy to say that lots of pro-Palestinians aren't anti-Semitic. I would say Palestinian society, the Palestinians themselves, are deeply anti-Semitic. And we could go to polls. We could go to polls. 93% of the population compared to 10% of the population in, in the UK polled as anti-Semitic. Uh, in the ADL 2014 poll that they put out. Um, you've got leaders of the Palestinians, the moderates like Abu Mazen doing their thesis on Holocaust denial. You've got people like um, Ahmed Baha, one of the leaders of Hamas, saying our nation, or, um, that is something like that needs to remove the cancerous lump that is the Jews. You've got like the huge, a huge problem with anti-Semitism. What I would caveat that with though, is if you went to Israeli society, you will also see that there is anti-Arab racism. We're with obviously, I'm not saying every Israeli is anti Arab, but there's definitely issues of racism. It's an anti Arab society. Um, no, I wouldn't say it's an anti Arab society. Just the have Arab... Have it embedded in their society. But okay, I would say, I would say if you index Israeli society, you will not find that 93% of them hold anti Semitic views, which so, is what the, the ADL found. So, so that I mean, you, you'll forgive me if I don't trust the uh. <laughs> the ADL's polling, um, or their framing of the question, or APAC, or or the uh, the IHRA. Um, I think that part of the problem, and you, you mentioned Mohammed Al Kurd, he he wrote a wonderful. Mark, they, did, sorry to interrupt. They literally have a law that bans Jews from citizenship. So this is where I'm going. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. This is where I'm going. Uh, and Mohammed Al Kurd brings get, gets into this in a wonderful piece that 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 he uh, that he wrote that I'll, I'll post in the in the comments. Again, Z political Zionism as a practical as an ideological matter, but I would argue it certainly as a practical political matter, has conflated Jewishness with Israeli identity, with um, with faith, with politics. All these things get get melded together, right? To the to the point that most not most. Yeah, I'd say most Zionists would say that if you're anti-Zionist and you're anti-Semitic, definitionally. Would you agree with that? Sorry, I just got distracted. My wife's returned. I've got to go in five minutes. So okay, I repeat believe the you question. do. Repeat the I, I know the wife's side eye of like, you got you got five minutes. Um, um, most Zionists would say anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. Right? Um, yeah, I'd, I'd say that I'd agree with that by and large, yeah. Exactly. And so if you don't create any space to have a critique of Zionism without making it definitionally anti-Semitic, then yes, if you, if, if, you, if you go to a people who have been oppressed and who have been dispossessed, and we can come back and have the settler colonial debate separately because I know that's a whole other conversation. But if, 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 if a settler colonial society has come and dispossessed me of my land and put me under occupation and siege and bombardment, and, and the identity under which they've done it is the Jewish state. And they've identified as Jewish. And they have identified the project as expanding Jewishness and the Jewish right to self-determination. And the flag has the Star of David on it. Then there is a conflation of Jewishness as a religious faith, as an, ethni as an ethnicity, as a national identity, etc. cetera. And so, and so when someone in Khalil, when someone in Hebron says, uh, or, or someone in Sheikh Jarrah has a better example, because that's Muhammad al kurds example, says, a, 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 a Jew stole my land. It's not, he said, and it's not my fault they're Jewish. He's not pointing to their Jewishness, but, the, but they're doing it under the imprimatur of the Jewish state. The Jewish state is the thing that's dispossessing people. And so I agree, let me be very clear. There is anti-Semitism. I'm not disputing that, I'm not denying that. It's ugly, it's vicious, it's all over the world. Not denying that at all. But much of what you, we are attributing to Palestinian society as anti-Semitic is actually not a not a a resistance or rejection of Jews, but a rejection of a Jewish ethno state that has denied them rights and freedom and self-determination simply because they are not Jewish. That's the point. OK, and I, I hear your argument. I, I will have to go. So I'm going to try and wrap up the final point, which was okay. Palestinians don't want peace just for the, the, the sake of brevity. And my, my closing remark. Um, so 
in terms of the Palestinians not wanting peace, in 1921, they rejected a two-state solution, effectively, when the Emirate of Jordan was carved out of mandatory Palestine and a Jewish homeland was rejected in the rest. That, would have, that alone gave the Arabs 75% of the land, but that was rejected. In 1937, the Peel Commission awarded the Arabs 96.5% of mandatory Palestine, but they said no to that as well and rejected the idea of a Jewish state in a much a, a tiny fraction, just basically the north of Israel. In 47, they rejected the UN proposal, and then a year later, five Arab armies invaded Israel. In 1950, you effectively had the annexation of the West Bank from Jordan. They, they didn't call it Palestine, they called it Jordan. And the Arabs living within Israel rejected um, a two-state solution effectively then, or it could have been a three-state solution with Gaza going to Egypt. Um, in 1993, they rejected Oslo. In 2000, Camp David. In 2008, Olmert offered them a two-state solution. Basically, all of the West Bank, all of Gaza, with minor adjustments to um, certain settlements like Gush Etzion coming into Israel, but more land going to the Palestinians um, from, from Israel itself. Um, the old city was to be shared amongst the custodianship of the Jordanians, the Saudis, the Palestinians, the Americans and the Israelis, including the Holy Basin. You effectively had the perfect two-state solution and it was rejected. The Trump plan also was rejected, but that one I'll be more lenient with. Um, that, but what I'm saying is every single state, the Palestinian, every single state, sorry, I've got my daughter in the background, every single state that the Palestinians were offered, they rejected it. Why? Because it meant accepting a Jewish state alongside it. And that is the, 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 the elephant in the room. That is what needs to be discussed when we're discussing, do the Palestinians want peace? If you mean they don't mind coexisting with Jews as a minority population within their Palestinian state, that's not peace. Peace is two states coexisting, and the Palestinians have said no to every single state that's been offered to them. And then my final thing to bring it all back to, like to wrap everything up is, the reason we're able to have this hour and 10 minute conversation, and hopefully another conversation in the future about settler colonialism, is because it's complicated. If it weren't complicated, we wouldn't have these differences of opinions. If you spoke to any Jew, they'd come with, or not any Jew, but you spoke to many Zionists and many Zionist Jews, They'd come with similar narratives that you maybe wouldn't accept, and they wouldn't accept your narratives because it is complicated. This is a complicated conflict. It's not a case of white Europeans coming in and stealing indigenous Palestinians' land. Uh, that's not the argument. It is so much more complex than that, which is why we've been able to discuss this for the last hour and 10 minutes. And I'll, we'll wrap this up in, 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 in 60 seconds. Um, and please give my... Gratitude and apologies to your lovely, beautiful family um, for their patience. Um, one, the idea that pa pa I've never met any group of people that does not want peace. Um, as I say in the video, justice is the precondition for peace. And so when Palestinians are fighting for land, fighting for freedom, fighting for rights, it's not because they like to war. Um, it's because they want a fair and just solution. And yes, there is a series of offers and negotiations that have been made, none of which have been fair. Um, I mean, I, I, we don't have time to go through each one, but if, if you look at the Peel Commission, you'd say, okay, Israel would have, in the Peel Commission, uh, I'm sorry, not the Peel Commission, the, um, oh yeah, we can look at the Peel Commission, actually. Uh, the, the Peel Partition uh, would have given Arab control over the regions that would have given, excuse me, Jewish control over the regions that Arabs needed the most for 82, 82 to 85% of their exports. Um, if you look at the UN uh, uh, split a decade later, um, it was giving an it was giving a disproportionate amount of land to, the, to a group of people that didn't own the majority of private, pri private, how, private property or the demographically was dramatically overrepresented. Um, if we look at uh, the more recent because I think at this point, sadly, we're old now. Those are like ancient history, right? But if we look at the more modern two-state solution offers, they have offered solutions that have basically divided, and we kind of saw it with Oslo, that have basically turned the uh, Palestinian land into Bantustans. It's a bunch of individual um, disconnected pieces of land that 
don't allow that. So it's not contiguous land. It's not access to water. It's not it's, it doesn't give the ability to grow crops and have proper exports. It doesn't give proper space for, for security and military. And so the idea that somehow we just keep making these great offers to you and 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 you won't take them is 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 somewhat bizarre to me because I come from the settler colonial framework. And so for me, it's like you're in my house. You won't leave. And you keep saying, well, I offered you the bedroom. I offered you the kitchen. Now I'm offering you the basement, too. Why won't you take it? It's like, but it's my house. And so at some point, we may have to come to a, a reasonable conclusion if we're battling over whose house it is. Um, but I think there's some irrefutable and indisputable facts about that. And to the last point you made as we leave, again, I never said that it that there aren't compl- complexities involved in this. Again, that becomes a straw man. I agree. And I, I conceded at the beginning of the video before I even met you. There's all kinds of complex stuff around. Indig- and I named all the things indigeneity around faith. Around co- around colonization, around uh, faith, or there's there's a bunch of complexities. My point isn't that after a hundred years there's nothing complex about this or nothing complicated about this. My point is that the idea of it's being co- of it being complicated can be you. For, I'll give you one example. If if Joseph Cohen is the most faithful and loving person I know, but let's say you cheated on your wife, right? And you're explaining to her, and you get caught cheating. You could say, well, you haven't, it, 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 why, you know, cheating is wrong. Yeah, but, you know, I, I felt emotionally abandoned and there was this other thing and, you know, I have a complex this. You could have a million complicated reasons that are all legitimate, but at the end of the day, your wife will probably say you cheated, right? And that's my point. Not that there aren't complexities, but there's a fundamental a moral transgression and ethical transgression and legal transgression that's happened that cannot be um, explained away through the kind of sanitizing logic and rhetoric of it's complicated. And Joseph Cohen has never cheated on his wife, neither have I. That's a totally, <laughs> completely, I should have probably said robbed a bank. That probably would have been a better one. Yes, that, robbing a bank would have been a better one. But y'all get my point. Um, Joseph, I know you got to go. Um, thank you for this no, conversation. I really appreciate it. I'll just say my, 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 my closing thing. I think that you, you sum, summarized it perfectly for me. If Jews having 3.5% of British mandatory Palestine is too much because they're controlling what, Palestinians believe are their main ports of export, so Haifa, Akko, et cetera, then that's that's the issue for me. And that's that's what we have to overcome. If Jews having 3.5% of the land is too much, that's what we mean when we say that they don't want peace. They want a Palestinian state over all of the land. And I think we're maybe agreeing then. Uh, that's like we we define peace in different ways. Like for you, if I understand you correctly, um, that was a just the, the Palestinians were justified in the rejection of the field partition because it did give the Jews land which they be, they wanted they felt was preferable. That's not exactly what I'm saying because I, okay. I don't want people to walk away thinking that I said that the problem is the Jews got three percent of the land because what okay. people will hear is I'm upset the Jews got three percent. You know that's not what I'm saying. I, I'm I'm saying that there were legitimate reasons for Palestinians to reject every single land split that's been made. I may have my own opinion about the more recent one and, and the Clinton Accords, but but it's not up to me. At the end of the day, it wasn't because they didn't want peace is my point. It's because they may have a different idea of what fairness and justice is, and I'm inclined to to agree to agree with them. Um, Joseph, uh, how can I want people? Uh, there are people here who follow you anyway and who are fans of yours or who hate me and will love you by, by virtue of that. I want them to find your website so or or and your YouTube channel so. They should go to Israel Advocacy Movement on Twitter, Instagram, and on YouTube, correct? Yeah, yeah. Well, on all the social medias. So, yeah, if you want to hear more or tell me what a shaitan I am in, <laughs> in the comments, then head over to the Israel Advocacy Movement. And I'm going to do the next one because I don't want him to re- I don't want him to repost this on his platform because I need that. I need the, I'm, I'm a very poor man. Um, but what I will do is I will do one on your platform next. Uh, that would be oh, uh, that would be delightful. It would be an honor. Yeah, I think that's the fair thing to do. Um, I just want yeah. a fair split. <laughs> That's it. All right. No, I do. I appreciate your your honesty. I appreciate the 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 giving me this platform to discuss because as I started, the only way we arrive at peace is through dialogue like this. And so hopefully um we can have more and I can continue to learn from you and you can continue to learn from a hardcore ultra Zionist. (laughs) Ultra. All right, my brother. I'll talk to you soon. Peace. Thank you. All right, family, you heard the debate, you heard the conversation, you heard the dialogue. It was a spirited one. I'm glad y'all got to check it out. 
Uh, make sure you check out everything on the channel. There's more coming. We're going to have a conversation with Joseph Cohen on his channel, too. I want you to support that if you want to watch it. Uh, I think it'll be worthwhile for sure. Um, on my end, I want you to watch all this. If you came in late, rewind and watch it again. Uh, but also watch all the content, including the five myths about Israel and Palestine video that brought this whole conversation about. It's on the channel. It's there for you to watch. Make sure you do hit the like button if you enjoyed this content. It also lets the YouTube algorithms know that you like this content and makes it more accessible to everybody. Hit the subscribe button. If y'all haven't subscribed after this kind of conversation, what do you need? Hit the subscribe button. Hit the join button so that you can become part of the MLH uh, TV family. It's important to do that. And of course, family, if you are so inclined, we'd be forever grateful if you also drop something in the Cash App. Go to Cash App, uh, dollar sign MLH TV and make a contribution. What it does is it allows us to expand the platform. It allows us to get better editors. Joseph caught something that we need to fix. He's right. That's why we need more editors. That's why we need uh, more studio space. We need all that stuff. So every time you donate, it, support, it, it supports us and it supports the channel. But if you do nothing else, just hit like, just hit, hit subscribe, and just keep studying and learning about these issues that matter so much. My family, my brothers, my sisters, I love you. I'll talk to you later. Peace.